Thank you. Pleasure to be here, and thank you to the organizers, wherever you are, for inviting me. Um, so, this is definitely something completely different. As you can see, I put up this, this uh, grandiose, slightly pretentious title, and uh, in 20 minutes or so, I'm going to try to talk about all these things. Um, let's see. So, um, this is my estimate of what the planet looked like at night, taken by a NASA satellite in the year I was born, which was 1940. And this is what it looks like now. Well, three years ago, anyway. And of course, you recognize immediately what's going on. In that short period of time, the planet has got sort of, got, got some kind, kind of bonkers in terms of urbanization, because that represents economic activity, electricity being produced, big lights uh, to where people live. So, just put the numbers on that, um, we are expanding at a faster than exponential rate, and if you average over the next uh, uh, 30, 40 years, we're urbanizing at a rate of about one and a half million people a, 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 a month. And um, you can see some numbers here, the US and its typical developed countries have got from a few percent being urbanized to over 80 percent being urbanized uh, in just 200 years. Uh, the planet crossed, crossed the halfway mark just a few years ago, and it's headed to that 70, 80 uh, percent by the end of the century. That's the number I said every month, I meant every week. And that's equivalent to adding a New York metropolitan area every couple of months. The Toronto, which you see around you, every five to six days, or in Denmark, every week. That's what's happening now. That's what's happening as we look. And that's putting extraordinary stresses and strains on everything you can think of. Um, and indeed, we'll put a stress and strain on how you use AI. And maybe at the end, we'll talk a little bit about that. So the paradigm, of course, that has been invoked for, since the Industrial Revolution is the idea of open-ended growth, since the discovery of fossil fuels, the discovery of capitalism, and their ex the extraordinary success that's brought the kind of quality and standard of living that we're all privileged to uh, participate in. But none of this can happen. None of it can happen. No AI in the future can obviously happen. No thought in anyone's head can happen unless it's supplied by energy. And if you use energy to make order out of disorder, you also inevitably produce disorder, and that's called the second law of thermodynamics. And that is the most fundamental law of physics that transcends everything else. So, in producing energy and using energy in a useful way, we create useless energy, which is called entropy. So, here's what I mean by that. Things like this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and of course this. And the question is, is that what our cities are going to look like? Because some of them already do uh, in 20, 50, 100 years, or something like this. Is that what's going to happen? And that's a question about the future of the planet. And maybe in the discussion, we can talk about how AI might help with that. So when you think of cities, you usually think of the physicality of the cities. Uh, the roads and the infrastructure, the, the boulevards of Paris, the skyscrapers of New York. But of course, the city is not much more than that. It's incredibly much more than that because the city is a machine, maybe the most extraordinary machine, the most extraordinary artificial intelligence that has evolved on the planet beyond biology that has created all this. And it is, in fact, the intersection between its physicality and the infrastructure and the information exchange between people. So the, the city is the combination of people interacting and uh, the idea of producing of innovation, of wealth, and so on. And that's what has contributed extraordinarily to what we're doing now. In fact, this is integral to what a city is about, this gathering here. And here you see something that's gone on 
for symbolically at least for a couple of thousand years, the stage is still the same, the people have come and gone, but they've been doing the same thing, interacting and sitting around bullshitting the way you've all been doing uh, in the last couple of hours, especially maybe you all morning. Uh, but, um, and most of the bullshit that goes on in situations like this is sort of useless to everybody else, but occasionally, metaphorically speaking, this phenomenon produces a Google, a Microsoft, the theory of relativity, quantum mechanics. That's where ideas and wealth are created by this phenomenon. So cities are this extraordinary interface and integration between these two opposites. The energy and resources, the infrastructure, the physicality, metabolism in the words of biology, um, with information exchange, the genom genomics of the system, and how that creates wealth and innovation. So given that central role that cities play, uh, it's remarkable that there hasn't been developed what you could call the science of cities. So uh, given the central role that it plays because that's where people live and that's where all the action takes place, that's where the smart people are, that's where the wealth and ideas are created, we desperately need to think about developing a science of cities. Now, when we think of that, it seems like uh, that would be a daunting task because it invokes all of these things and much more. This is just an arbitrary list I put together. And you notice I put boxes around it because the way we generally deal with these problems is we put boxes around them and each person becomes a specialist, not just in a general area, but in a very specific area. So that this is also misleading this picture because inside those boxes are other boxes all highly siloed and within those are other boxes. And that's the way we have progressed. And what we do not often recognize is that each one of these systems is a complex, adaptive, evolving system interacting with every other one. And there is a systemic problem that we have to deal with in how all of these are integrated. So to put it slightly differently is to emphasize that they are all, none of these are independent. And, they, and the whole thing is a highly complex adaptive system made up of multiple complex adaptive systems, which makes the idea of developing a science, and by science I mean quantitative, mathematizable, computable, predictive, and so forth. So I'm going to switch gears very briefly and talk a little bit about biology. Already this morning, when you, if you were listening carefully, you heard metaphorical bullshit using biology, like metabolism of the city, the ecology of the marketplace, and so on. But the question is, are these more than metaphors, or are there something more serious? So here's a bunch of questions, biological questions, which, are, which you can think of in terms of socioeconomic problems. Why is it that we stop growing? Why is it that I can say with certainty everybody in this room will be dead in a hundred years. Uh, where does that come from? Why well, can I also say with certainty, pretty much, that everybody in this world would have to sleep six, seven, eight hours a night, and not, like you used to, sleep 15 or 16 hours a night when you were a little baby. Or if you were a mouse, you would also have to sleep uh, 15 or 16 hours. And if you were an elephant, only three hours. Where the hell does all that come from? Socioeconomic analogous uh, analogs to that are, why is it that the companies that you're associated with by the time you're dead will also disappear? Why is that? Why will most all companies disappear? Yet cities will persist. Very rarely the cities disappear. And one thing that was a theme this morning, why is it that life continues to accelerate? So let's try to talk about that. So this is us. We're one of these, which we move over eight orders of magnitude, and we've all evolved uniquely. Each organ in us, each cell type, each genome is unique. So if you plotted anything associated with these, anything that you could measure, and you plotted it on a graph, you'd expect the points to be all over the graph, reflecting the historical contingency and evolutionary history of the organism. Well, quite the contrary, this is the most fundamental quantity of life, 
your whole life, and that is metabolic rate, how much energy, how much food you need to eat each day. And there is plotted logarithmically up by factors of 10. And what you see is that systematically, uh, underneath that extraordinary complexity and diversity, there exists an unbelievable simplicity. And this simplicity is represented by that straight line of all, all organisms fit on it. And that also has built into it uh, another simplicity, and that is that the slope of that line is very close to the number three quarters. And uh, that's sort of amazing because what it says is the bigger you are, the less energy your cells need per capita by about 25% or one quarter. So there's this extraordinary economy, systematic economy of scale, and that manifests itself through all of life. But if you look at any physiological variable, and here's just something but any like your heart rate, it also has a very simple form uh, in a similar way, and the slope of that line is minus one for the minus meaning it's decreasing with size. And here's something that you might think of to yourself, your white to gray matter in the brain. And you see again extraordinary simplicity, and it goes and it the, the, the slope of that is five quarters. And indeed, I could show you 75 more graphs like this and bore the hell out of you in the afternoon. But everything you can measure, and they all look exactly like this, and they all have the following property that they all have slopes in multiples of one quarter. So the number four constrains the whole biosphere around us. And the question is, where the hell does that come from? The idea is that the one commonality across all organisms is that we are all operated by networks. We are completely network systems. And it is the mathematics and physics of these networks, the generic principle properties, that lead to these scaling points. So it's these kinds of things across all of biology that lead to that. And one can make a complete theory and derive those scaling laws, the origin of the number four, the one quarter, and derive things like how long you're going to live, and how quickly you grow, and how soon you're going to die, and so on. I don't have time to go into that. But since everybody in this room is obsessed with growth, I'm sure, I wanted to tell you about growth, about you, about biology first, and then I'm going to end up by talking about the growth of cities and potentially economies. So here's growth. You've all done it. You've all scaled. And growth works very simply in this picture. You have, you take, you eat, you metabolize the energy, you send it through the networks, the networks feed cells, and at the cellular level, they do two things, generically speaking. They repair and maintain what's there and grow new stuff. So that's what that says there. And you can put that into mathematics using that theory I just mentioned about network based on networks. And when you do that, you can calculate, on absolute terms, the growth curve for any organism. So here's you, except you as a rat. Uh, that is the solid line is prediction from the theory. The data, those are data points. And uh, the important thing is you stop growing. Something maybe that's bothered you. That you keep on eating, but you stop growing. Why? Well, the theory explains it. It's to do with the economy of scale of your metabolism controlled by the networks. And that leads to bounding growth. I put in one more slide here about this. It turns out this is a universal theory. And so it, uh, the mathematics tells you that if you plot it with the right variables, instead of just putting weight versus size, you, the theory tells you what variables to use. Everybody, every organism, grows in the same way when you look through the right scaling lens. And that's what that graph is with just some subset of organisms there. So, it's life around you. It's dominated by these systematic, predictable, calculable scaling laws, dominated by the number four. The economies of scale, but I didn't emphasize this, the pace of life systematically decreases following these scaling laws. The bigger you are, the slower everything is. Things take much longer and you live longer. Growth stops and then you die. The whole theory can explain that, but it's all explained by the Now, 
What about cities and companies? Are cities and companies scale versions of one another? As I said, despite appearances, uh, a whale which lives in the ocean, a giraffe has a long neck and we walk on two feet and a mouse scurries around. Despite appearances, we are at the 80 90 percent level in terms of anything that you can measure about us scale versions of each other. The question is, is New York just the scaled up Los Angeles, which is a scaled up Santa Fe, which is where I live, despite different histories, geographies, and cultures. Well, they are network systems, obviously. They have transport networks and uh, gas networks and water networks. They're supplied by networks. But the most important thing about a city is not all that infrastructure. It's you. It's you interacting. It is social networks, the structure of social networks, and Part of that being two very important points that are often forgotten. One is modularity. We have groups, we have families, groups, departments, and so on. And regardless of the internet, and regardless of everything else, you have to be standing on a two-dimensional space, on a two-dimensional floor somewhere. Could be the bathroom, could be the kitchen, it could be your office, whatever. You have to be on a two-dimensional space, and you have to move because you have to go to school, you have to go to your office, you have to go buy stuff, and so on. And if you put those together, you can derive scaling laws for cities. So that's what that thing I showed earlier is actually the interface of all these things. And here's what you find. So if you believe all that network stuff, you predict that the scaling laws should also persist in cities. And indeed, here's something mundane. Petrol stations, gas stations, versus city size, and there's four European countries, and there you see that uh, they all scale very nicely, and they all have similar slopes. Instead of 0.75, it's 0.85. There's a 15% saving instead of a 25% saving every time you double the size of a city. But what is amazing, it's true of all infrastructure, and it's true for all infrastructure everywhere across the world. Urban systems scale the same in the United States, in European countries, in Japan, in China, Latin America, everywhere, and so on. But this is the uninteresting part as far as I'm concerned, the buildings and roads and so on. What is really interesting is what's happening here is information exchange, and that's to do with socioeconomic continents, such as what's budget on the left, our wages on the right, are the number of sexy professional people called Super Traders by the University of Florida, which lives somewhere around here. Um, and what you see here is something you've never seen in biology. It's something called super linear scaling. The bigger you are, instead of the less per capita, you get more per capita, and you get more per capita by about 15%. The slope of this is about 1.15. And what you see is that this is true across all socioeconomic metrics. It's innovation, and it's also 1.15. Number of patents, using patents as the proxy for innovation. Another innovation quality, crime in Japan here. This is uh, what I wrote here police, tax receipts, restaurants, and so on. And again, if you look across the globe in any country, at any socioeconomic continent versus the size of a city, it always scales in the same way. And I've just put a panel of, of half a dozen different metrics in different places. And so what it says in English is that every time you double the city, on average, income, wealth, patents, colleges, good, bad, and the ugly, disease, crime, all increase by about 15%, regardless of the city. And at the same time, you save 15% of all infrastructure. Cities are good in these terms because we repress the bad and the ugly, and the bigger the better. You get more back for your buck in socioeconomic activity. And the question is, where the hell does all this come from? Why are these these fundamental scaling laws? Why are they so systematic and why are they correct through across the globe? It wasn't as if Portugal and China had some treaty as to how to design their urban systems. No. What it was that we evolved organically. And the commonality, of course, is our social networks are pretty much the same, independent of history, geography, and culture. And it is the positive feedback mechanisms in the 
social networks that lead to the super linear state. So I talk to you, you talk to her, I talk to you, you talk to me, and we sit around bullshitting, but we build up, we continually build it. And that building could be about a football game, could be about a deep theory of economics, could be about how AI is going to be a total failure, could be any of these things. But we're continually building, and it is that which gives rise to this superlative behavior. And that's what you're putting to mathematics. That's what I put here. And uh, it also has another consequence, and that is, as you might guess, it speeds up systematically and predictably the pace of life. And can I finish with one last thing? I'm going to miss this out. Growth, so mimic what you do, what happens in biology. It's like something, it's so metabolic rate, it's social metabolic rate. All the things that come in that are uh, part of what drives an economy or a city, or the resources, the products, the ideas, that so this is a complicated equation in principle. But again, it can be thought of as going towards maintaining what's there and growing new stuff. And in biology, that's what we saw. The sublinear behavior, the economy of scale leads to the stopping of growth. And what is beautiful is that the superlinear behavior of social interactions, the positive feedback, leads to, I've just got a cartoon version, the super exponential growth that we see in our economic system and in our cities. And that's fantastic. So it's a very consistent theory, and I don't have time to show you data uh, that, that uh, confirms it. But here's the point I want to emphasize, I've got to finish. Agnostic lie is a fatal flaw, if you like, not in the mathematics, but it's just that dotted line in the mathematics is called a finite time singularity. Maybe you heard the word singularity. What that says is that in some finite time, five years, ten years, twenty years into the future, not an infinite time in the future, but in some finite time, the system has to collapse. That's what that line goes to infinity, and that's what the right hand side, that's what the equation say it collapses. And the question is, how do you stop that collapse? And you stop it by innovation, because you recognize that that growth has, been, has taken place within a paradigm. You discover coal, you discover bronze, you discover you invent computers, you invent IT, maybe we invent AI or whatever. But so what it says is that before you hit the singularity, you must reinvent yourself, you must make a paradigm shift, you must make a major innovation, and you start over again, and you will again hit singularity, and you will collapse. And so there's a theorem you can prove that produce that magnet that says you have to have these cycles of innovations or paradigm shifts, but it has another fatal flaw, because the theory predicts, yes, you can do that, but you have to do it faster and faster. So you have to necessarily, predictably, do it faster and faster. I'm going to finish off on this. this. I have no idea who this guy is. I found it on the web, but I loved it because it looked like my work. And what he has is the time to reach 10 million customers. This is a proxy for the speed of innovation. I loved it because I took all those numbers and they fit exactly the prediction of this theory I just told you. Uh, and he also fits it. I think I stole this from Singularity University. I don't know. I don't care. But uh, I, because I'm late, I don't even try to explain it. But that tells you the rate of innovation. That red line is exactly what's predicted by the theory or the plotted logarithmically that line. So, in finishing, I don't have time to talk about companies why all your companies are going to eventually disappear like you will. But the question is, is this sustainable, this fact that we have to go faster and faster? And the image I like to project is a Sisyphean image of rolling the rock up the hill, and of course it falls down again, and we have to keep doing it. And Sisyphus had it easy compared to us, because every time it comes down, we have to push it up, faster and faster every time, and eventually you're going to have a heart attack. So I leave you. <laughs> Sorry. Sound check, sir. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. It was um, such a pleasure. And 
Uh, maybe before we dive into a uh, question about accelerating into our own demise, um, I, I did want to ask you, uh, as I've been a big fan of your work for a while, and as you describe it, life is, if not dominated, at least bounded by these predictable nonlinear scaling laws, which speaks to some of the point you make in the rest of your work that science by its nature should be general and predictable and predictive. And so that makes me question, in your view, is AI at odds with the basic scientific method as we know it today? In that, does does AI risk lulling us into predictions that appear true but possibly lack rigorous uh, models and approaches? Well, um, it's that's a very tough question to answer. First of all, because uh, even though AI has been around for thirty years. Uh, it's uh, taken on a bit of meaning in the last two or three years, uh, maybe the last five years or so, because it's starting to be used as a powerful tool. And it is extraordinarily powerful and will be incredibly useful. Uh, but you're asking, so, so that's what was discussed mostly in this morning, was its uses and that sort of tool. Uh, and what you're asking, in my interpretation anyway, is, how would it impact science and scientific inquiry and the idea of laws? And indeed, there is, there's been a, uh, a thread in Silicon Valley, especially, that uh, we don't need, you know, these laws and quantum mechanics and all that, all that other stuff and so on. You just, again, do what they, you know, take data, you have an algorithm, you turn a crank, and that comes what you want. Uh, I think that, of course, that's a very naive view. Uh, make a cartoon version of it. But um, there is a, a very important role for that in science. But I think um, uh, what it misses is that uh, the, the extraordinary generality that science brings to it and the idea of principles, what are the underlying principles. I mean, I can imagine uh, AI having uh, somehow vaguely discovered versions of the laws of electricity and magnetism. But uh, it took uh, James Clark Maxwell to uh, recognize that uh, by writing them mathematically, so having them in some computer, writing it with data, uh, writing them mathematically, he predicted electromagnetic waves and the speed of light. And without that, none of you would have a job. As far as I can tell, since you all live off of electromagnetism, basically. Uh, so without that, without uh, understanding that, we wouldn't. So, so I think it's very unlikely that AI can be useful in that sense. I mean, there's still something about the human mind that is very synergistic and intuitive, which is very hard to uh, uh, really to replicate algorithmically. So I, I think there are several people in this room who are, who are chasing after um, more general AI theories who might uh, attempt to disagree with you on yeah, that. Well, but, well. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think we're roughly in agreement. You, 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 you chuck it off. Here's the point. I just want to say one other thing. I think the truth of the matter is you have to have both. It would be, it would be uh, a serious error of uh, traditional science to ignore it, which it isn't anyway. Uh, and it would be um, an even greater error in some ways for AI to charge ahead in terms of this conceptual way of thinking without incorporating and trying to integrate um, you know, this, this other paradigm, this traditional way right. of uh, doing science. Right, so I, I think that the, the broader point is that there there is a risk of, of dangerous AI models that are in mimic for practices or faulty data and you know, this morning we spoke about bias and misdirection, and we have some very valid points on that, on those points. And I think potentially if we're mindful about the causal inferences in our models, and we look at the observational data, and we pull out what we can say are provable results as a result of these models, do you believe that there's an approach in which AI accelerates the scientific method and helps us kind of call the search space? I think you can. There's no, oh, there's, not, there's no question that it could. So not I don't know. I don't know any. Um, I don't know any examples other than on a very small scale that, that has happened. Obviously, in terms of uh, many things in biology, many things in medicine, and so on, there are aspects where uh, 
having a machine learning as part of the process is uh, incredibly important to find and may well be things that uh, human beings will be able to do. On the other hand, I think AI left to itself, so to speak, what that means, I think would not be, uh, is, is incredibly dangerous, actually. Because it would be incredibly misleading. In, in well, because uh, because one of the things you learn about dealing with a complex system, as I try to say here, just in passing, is that there are so many components and so many subsystems that are interrelated and continually evolving and interacting that um, capturing that in a limited algorithm is essentially impossible. That's why it's been impossible so far to uh, uh, do you know, in terms of scientific simulations, uh, to do much more than rather simple physical systems. Sure. I'm just not sure that that's at odds with the way that we've developed any prior scientific theory, right? The, I mean, for a long time, we assumed that the Earth was at the center of our solar system, and it wasn't until we, were, we pulled back sure. and, and thought about the world from a different perspective um, that we actually considered that that possibly we're not the center of our universe and that there are different governing laws. And I just wondered if AI, it appears, should go down that same direction. Is that we'll have a misguided bias and approach and then eventually land on. Well, the, the, the great thing about AI is that it is, in that sense, very traditional conservative because it relies on data. Right. And no science can progress without data. Um, it, it's inspired by data. And the search for regularities among data is what uh, you know, begins uh, a process of developing uh, an important model or theory. Um, so, uh, you know, that part I think is, uh, you know, I don't think I have any quarrel uh, with Quite the contrary, I think it's, it's a critical aspect. And that's where AI can be most helpful. But I think in, in trying to I mean, the thing that AI can do for most situations is really tell you what's going to happen in the relatively near future. It's very difficult, and that's why big theories become important, is to tell you what the big picture is going to look like. Moving into the, into the future where you see multiple components of the system interacting. So, so that aligns well with, uh, I think, the last question that we recently had time for, which is today we've spoken a lot about growth and the increasing rate of change within this lens of AI, um, and, and specifically, possibly because we're at a business school and, and we have the pleasure of being involved in CDL, uh, we're talking about a very particular type of growth, often related to economic growth. And your work, to some extent, suggests that that might be a fool's and errand as we're just accelerating towards our singularity points. Uh, so no, my... I'm <laughs> <I'm looking for laughs> to be picky about it. Um, uh, and, and so, well, my question then becomes uh, that if not growth as the, the driver we should be driving after, what factors should we be optimizing for in, well, in our work? In it, it's not optimizing growth. Just let me clarify something. I'm, um, it's not a full zero. Uh, but uh, what it is, what I consider AI doing is like in all previous major innovations is speeding up the clock. And we heard that today, actually you heard that very actually explicitly, I loved it. I'd like to get some of those examples. It's speeding everything up, just as the telephone sped everything up. Or the, you know, or the, as I said, the discovery of iron in thousands of years ago, or whatever. Yes. But that speeds everything up. So, um, uh, the, what I, I wouldn't say optimizing on growth, but I think uh, one of the problems we have is the obsession with growth. And uh, the question is to uh, what is growing? What is it that we want to grow? You know, we don't want to necessarily grow a population. We don't necessarily want to grow the GDP, maybe. What we presumably want, I know this sounds a bit flaky, but we want to grow well being and contentment, happiness, I don't know, these somewhat. But something that's sustainable, where um, it doesn't necessarily have to be tied to economic factors. And, uh, you know, we don't know. We don't know whether we can sustain this. Forget about anything I said without, without growth. And all I can say is that all of the data, all of the theoretical 
hitting point very strongly to uh, the fact that everything speeds up and you have to innovate faster and faster. And I suspect everybody in this room, um, in terms of their daily lives, feels and knows that viscerally. Well, Jeffrey, I want to thank you so much for your perspective and clarity today. It was wonderful. Thank you.